On August 1st, 1996, a fantasy novel about feuding and rival medieval families in a land of Westeros was released by George R.R. R. Martin. I think it goes without saying, at that time, he didn't even know the magnitude and heights this series labeled A Song of Ice and Fire could and would go. But just under 15 years later, we all got to see and experience it for ourselves and watched as Game of Thrones became one of the most significant and massive shows of all time. I mean, think about it. A nerdy ass series set in the dark ages about the fight between noble families for power, love, and control became the biggest show in pop culture history, and we loved it. But notice I said love. While Game of Thrones had one of the most meteoric rises in all of entertainment, it also was unfortunately plagued with one of the biggest fall offs as well. Before the new prequel series House of the Dragon put forth a revival of the love and fandom of the show, Game of Thrones all of a sudden became a flash in the pan out of nowhere. I'm talking about a show that was celebrated, loved by all media, fans, and critics alike, winning dozens of awards, over 100 nominations, quickly met with a swift and disastrous end. I mean, everyone started completely shitting on it. But what happened? I did a show that I say was deemed the greatest of all time, a show that continued to gain and garner new fans every single season up to the very end. How did that show completely fall apart? If you are new here, my name is Jarius and this is Chaos Conversation, a channel where we will do retrospectives and callbacks into the downfall, demise, and just complete derailing of some of the biggest movie franchises, TV shows, and TV networks of all time. And we had to start with probably one of the most substantial or biggest of all time, that being Game of Thrones. Now, before we dive into the fall of Game of Thrones, I have to explain and talk about the rise, what made it the sensation that it is in the first place, the noble houses. And the three, of course, I decided for this video are House Stark, House Lannister, and House Targaryen. And I decided to do that for two specific reasons. One, I obviously have the banners right here. So I thought this would be a cool element and aspect to add and a cool layer to put in on top of the video. And the second reason being, these three houses give and make up a majority of the major players and storylines throughout the show. So each will get their own section where I dive into each character within that house, their importance, personality, and main character arc throughout the entire series. And that way I'll be able to pinpoint specific moments and scenes that made the show the phenomenon that it is. After that, you'll be able to see and get a grasp of just how amazing, strong, and just raw the energy and feel for the show was. I also want to make clear that when I go over each character, it'll be more of a rough draft of their personality and where they end up after their character arcs. We'll dive deeper into the characters and their arcs later on when I talk about the turning point of the series and how they started failing at completing these character arcs in satisfying ways and that actually felt respectable to their characters. After I established the foundation of the characters and how they made the show what it was, I would then talk about how the series began to spiral out of control. Because explaining each house and their characters will paint the picture of just how careful and creative this world was set up to be. The amazing attention to detail of these characters, their complexities, and how all that was just lost in the later seasons. There's a lot of behind the scenes details and reasonings and explanations for the downfall of the show and why we had so much poor execution towards the end as well. So take this drive with me, strap in, fasten your seatbelts cause this is gonna be a long one. This is the meteoric ride of Game of Thrones explained. So we gotta start off with no other than House fucking Dark, man. Like, psst, I had to. House Stark is dead ass like family. Like, I was repping House Stark since the very beginning. Like, real shit. And I also wanted to say that I'm gonna be switching out my ski mask every time to represent each house. I got, of course, the red and yellow House Lannister. I got the red and black for House Targaryen. And I, I know. House Stark is gray and black. It's more dual colors, but I wore the blue to represent winter is coming and also represent the White Walkers, their whole plot and storyline and like shit like that. So, House Stark, let's dive right into it. 
Now, House Stark alone probably gives us the largest cast of characters from any house we're gonna dive into, and probably the most important characters and scenes that help paint the atmosphere and energy surrounding the rest of the characters and the show as a whole. They teach us the most lessons, give us the most understanding, lust, surprise, angst, and satisfaction for future storylines, plot points, and events take place through these characters. Their motto being winter is coming, which is a term used to represent the incoming of something treacherous or bad. And these characters and their moments of what they go through help create the most excitement and anticipation in the earlier seasons of what can possibly be to come later on in the story. Now, of course, they didn't necessarily deliver on all that hype and anticipation, but nevertheless, House Stark. Before we get into each separate character, House Stark as a whole is best described as built on honor and integrity, the want and will to do the best and right thing with pure and rightful intentions. Now, unfortunately, in Game of Thrones and the land of Westeros, this means absolutely nothing in the way the world and other people around them choose to function and maneuver to utilize this to their advantage. The Starks are very resilient and persevering as we will see when we dive into each of these characters. They come off as the most grounded characters in the story, grounded in the most realism in the entire series as well. They all have a strong will and a way of surviving or not and can often be seen as almost naive, but that naiveness gives them hope. So that's the full breakdown for the banner of House Stark. Now let's get into the characters. Now, of course, we have to start off and begin with no other than Ned fucking Stark, who is introduced to us as the main character in season one. He is the, our protagonist. He's who we're rooting for, fighting for. Ned is the pure definition of what I described House Stark as. He has the unwavering ideology of honor and justice and always doing what's right. He is the fundamental good guy and hero of any other story, but Game of Thrones isn't a regular story. See, because Ned Stark immediately shows and teaches us the weight of Game of Thrones in that first season, everyone knows the infamous Ned Stark death scene where he, the main character, is killed off season one of the show. Right from there, we learn and understand being morally good or ethics and righteousness within yourself doesn't negate the outside forces and the world around you. Your actions and decisions don't always necessarily change that of others. Good doesn't always win. See, most people call Ned foolishly honorable. And what they mean by that is he is more so an open book. He shows his hand than playing and partaking in the same game as everyone else, the Game of Thrones. This is what ultimately caused and created his downfall early in the series. But once again, he taught and showed us so much about the world and show we were beginning to take part in and also left a lasting impact on the rest of the Starks and the series as a whole. Once again, his death is probably one of the most iconic scenes in all of TV history History, and I promise you're gonna be hearing me say that a lot throughout this video but Ned Stark and his character was just the first of many that taught us about the world and atmosphere that was Game of Thrones next up we have Rob Stark who is the oldest of Ned's kids Rob is so much like Ned in a lot of ways but his downfall was kind of the complete opposite of what Ned and how Stark stood for what I mean by that is Rob is very dedicated and committed it with a strong sense of responsibility and obligation he learns a lot from his father and excels in leadership aspects and roles just like him following his father's death as i mentioned previously rob is named the new king of the north and goes to war against the lannisters and is pretty fucking successful he wins every single battle he even manages to capture jamie lannister who we'll dive into more later so what is the problem what was his downfall what happened well, see, unlike his father, Ned, Rob had to partake in the game of alliances and politics just like everyone else if he wanted to actually stand a chance. So Rob made a pact with Walder Frey to marry one of his daughters in turn for helping him fight in the war. 
he ultimately breaks that pact and decides to marry someone else entirely. Enraged by this, Walder Frey, along with Roos Bolton, sets up and betrays the Starks in return all under the plan of Tywin Lannister, who once again we will dive into later. So his downfall, unlike his father, was from him going back on his word and playing the game but ultimately losing in the end. This once again gave us another classic moment in TV history with the Red Wedding. This scene completely shook everyone, just the impact, the emotions, and the complete devastation from it all. Unlike Ned, Rob played the Game of Thrones and he lost. Catelyn Stark, mother of five and wife of Ned Stark is an incredibly proud and stern woman. She is very generous at times, but more so often is very protective when it comes to her kids, the love she has for them, and just their safety in general. Catelyn also does a very flawed, emotional, and impulsive character, which really humanizes her in comparison to other characters throughout the show. She makes, of course, bad decisions throughout, but she does it in the safety or in hopes to help her children in some way, shape, or form. She does also mistreat Jon Snow, Ned's bastard son, and resents his inclusion into their family. Overall, she just attempts to do whatever she can for her kids, whichever way she sees, which I can commend. She meets her doom at the Red Wedding next to her son, Rob Stark, but not before she puts in precautions that her children would be looked after in the long term. Her children were always her first concern, rightfully so, and she did the most for them until the very end. Next up, we have Arya. Arya is my favorite character in the entire show. She was the reason I was banging House Stark from day fucking one, like literally favorite character throughout the entire series like i fuck with the rest of the starks but aria she get back gang for real when she say get it back in blood that's what she mean so aria is ned stark's youngest daughter she often comes off as tomboyish and even gets mistaken for a boy from time to time she firmly rejects female roles and their pursuits in the land of westeros she just strongly opposes all of it aria is very independent and strong-willed she is what i would describe as a survivor aria has my favorite arc and motivation and pursuit of the entire series and it's just strictly hardcore revenge see aria was there when they executed her father ned stark she was there when the red wedding took place and her brother and mother were killed she has seen so much injustice and corrupt things that she started making a list of everyone she is going to kill one day anyone who wronged her her family or her friends and the list just gets longer and longer it starts consuming her where that is her only goal and reason to live that every night she can't even sleep without saying every name on her list this is her journey from the very beginning of the show up into literally the very end now once again we'll go over and dive into the unsatisfying execution but for the most part she was definitely my favorite her ambition grew out of hatred even though she was raised to be nice and loving by her father so i definitely wasn't content with her ending which i'll go over later but i'm not switching up definitely my favorite character and arc throughout the entire show next up we have sansa stark and sansa is the complete opposite of Arya, or should i say Arya is the complete opposite of her because see sansa loves and enjoys being a lady she is definitely naive early on and lost in dreams and ideas of how she'll be queen one day and having the perfect life i can admit initially i didn't like her character at all but I had to come to the realization that Sansa, after going through a multitude of traumatic events such as watching her father die or hearing of her brother and mother's death, being used as a hostage for the key to the north, pawned off and forced to marry Tyrion Lannister, being used and manipulated by Littlefinger. She goes through a multitude of events that force her to learn how to play the game just like everyone else. And it's just unfortunate it took a whole lot of mortifying events for her to understand and acknowledge that she must play the game just like everyone else she like Arya, is a survivor all the starks are really they're put through the ringer and forced to adapt as best they could and sansa is certainly a supreme showcase of that i do think she is also very combative at times to those who aren't 
really in agreement with her. She also did used to mistreat Jon Snow and look down upon him just as her mother did. I do once again get a sort of distaste for her towards the end again with her constant appeal for power and control. But once again, after all the disastrous circumstances that fell upon her throughout the show, it only makes sense that she wants a certain level of control to maintain in her everyday life. That's what she gets as she becomes Lady of Winterfell, or should I say, Queen of the North. Next up, we have Bran Stark, and this should be very quick because he's missing from an entire season and pretty much does nothing in the later seasons, but... He is a very curious minded person and very adaptable. He is even adventurous one could say, but takes a lot of risk. In episode one of the series, we see Bran's whole life completely change as he is pushed out of the tower by Jamie Lannister for witnessing the two siblings together. He continues to chase that adventure and curiosity itch though by going beyond the wall to find a three-eyed raven and essentially become a history textbook. And that's all I already got for you. So I guess more on that later, but that's a brand Stark. And last in the Stark household, but certainly not least, is Jon fucking Snow, the bastard of Winterfell, as they call him. And for being the bastard of Winterfell and not even Ned's real son, Jon Snow is easily the most comparable to him. Very stoic, honorable, and always trying to make the correct decision. He looks to benefit others as much as possible, even if it often comes at a distance service to himself he becomes a symbol for everyone he meets and his leadership begins to shine right through john accepting his reputation as a bastard and knowing there isn't much he could do decides to join the night's watch after battles with wildlings and for control of the night's watch he comes to the realization that the walkers are a bigger threat than any living person and the war label the war of the five kings is as pointless as ever he believes everyone must come together to fight the real threat of the White Walkers and the Night King. Now, nobody's character arc and development got slashed and eviscerated more than Jon Snow in the later seasons, but born that later. But that's all the Starks, their house, and what it represents, all of the major characters within it, the roles, personalities each one has, and set out to achieve in the land of Westeros. And I know a few of you are going to be talking about Rickson, but come on guys, what do you want me to say? I can't even remember one single line bro had. That's the Starks, on to House Lannister. <laughs> now on to house fucking lannister now the next two houses is gonna feel like a speed run but that's just because it's way less characters within these two especially house targaryen compared to house stark but that says nothing about the quality of these fucking characters because the four characters we're about to discuss in house lannister could all be considered for the top 10 of all time in the Game of Thrones franchise. And that's not an overstatement, but let's dive into House Lannister. From House Lannister, we learn and gain the most information into the political side of the Game of Thrones, the scheming and planning to outthink and outmaneuver your enemies to stay in a position of power. With their house model, hear me roar, the Lannisters are a very prideful house as seen and represented by their lying sigil. They often come off as smug and arrogant in the position they hold, their wealth, and cast over a feeling of them almost being untouchable. They, for the most part, have a high showcase in strategizing and being very intelligent to get themselves out of terrible spots or just remove themselves from any sort of disadvantage. The Lannister family are very ambitious and entitled as well, but who are the people that make up probably the best house within the series, House Lannister? Let's talk about it. So first up, we have the GOAT Tywin Lannister. Tywin Lannister, father of three, Tyrion, Jaime, and daughter Cersei, Tywin spends a vast majority of his time and efforts trying to uphold the prestige and status of House Lannister. Everything he helped build and for the sigil to stand for. He is a very calculated and dedicated person to this goal, which makes him come off as very controlling, cruel, and heartless. He doesn't care if he is respected or feared as long as his house is in a position of control. Tywin 
Roman is also great at the political field and operating within the game that everyone is playing to ensure that his family and his house stays at the top. This falls over into his relationships with his kids, who each he despises to a certain extent for separate reasons, or he feels those reasons disgrace the family name that he helped so hard to build, and they're just tearing it down. We of course will discuss those when we get to the children, but overall, Tywin, a man who puts all his endeavors upholding the stature of House Lannister, no matter who he has to fuck over to complete that mission. Friends, family, enemies alike, he wants to uphold the name of House Lannister. Jaime Lannister, known as the Kingslayer for the killing of course the Mad King that put the Baratheons and his family on the throne. He is the battle tested, the knight, the fighter of the Lannisters. He can often come off just as cruel and foul as his father and sister, but not without cause or to an extent. Early on in the series, he loses his hand and has to find who he really is without being a fighter, what he wants and just has to accept that. He also is in a relationship with his sister Cersei and is the real father of her three kids. His love for his sister controls a lot of his goals and actions throughout the series and it's what I firmly believe caused his character development later on in the show to just come to a screeching halt. He suppresses his distaste for the brutal world and actions he and his family take to keep their status. Jamie honestly is one of the most interesting and complex characters throughout the show, showing almost a sense of him being directionless and helpless, especially after he lost his hand as I mentioned. Him growing from being probably the most hated person in episode 1 to one of the most beloved in the whole franchise shows the level of writing they had with these characters, but once again, Later on, we'll see that was all for nothing. Tyrion Lannister, the youngest of all the siblings and most notable for being a dwarf and is treated as the castaway or the shame to house Lannister. After being hated, mistreated, and belittled, no pun intended, his whole life, Tyrion grew to be very resilient. He is also very intelligent as well and has a way with words that almost basically allows him to talk his way out of most situations. He is very clever and amusing which allows people besides his family to enjoy his company. He has all the political astuteness of his father and scheming of his family, but he comes off more kind and reserved in them as well. He shows mercy when it's time and has an understanding of things being bigger than just him or his family. I hate to say it, but Tyrion will be a prime example to talk about the terrible turning point that has yet to come in this series, but what's crazy is he used to give us some of the most knowledge and inside thoughts about the world and atmosphere of game of thrones like he used to drop so many gems his father tywin lannister did as well but Tyrion did it in a way that was just so witty and i don't know so he is was definitely a top five character within the show the entire time and i think most people would have had him as a top five character within fiction if they ended off the series correctly because that's how good a character he was throughout the show last but certainly not least is cersei daughter of tywin and mother of three to her brother jamie cersei is probably the most cunning and devious she is a master tactician and manipulator and using others to get what she wants hides her goals and ambitions but could never hide her true feelings to the people she comes in contact with she is very greedy and cold and exploits anyone she can but she does also have a very soft spot when it comes to her children and jamie sometimes that doesn't even stop her from trying to achieve the power and control she wants she comes off as purely evil with no redeeming qualities but she is also brave and does what she perceives is the best interest to her family majority of the time just as anyone else in the show does. She definitely has the strongest hatred towards her brother Tyrion and tries to assist in his demise every chance she gets. She is as despicable and as true a villain as they come in this show and doesn't do much to change throughout it. She actually only gets worse and worse to be real. That's a wrap for House Lannister though. Now as the same with the Starks, there are technically a few more members of the Lannisters, but those are the major players and characters who shed the light
light on House Lannister and give us watchers inside look or a different viewpoint and stance that very much opposes that of House Stark. They add on a bunch more diverse and complex members to the series and to the show who create and have captivating dynamics with all the other main and side characters within the story. Honestly, they could be considered for the best house and having the best characters within that house. Last up for our noble houses, we have House Fucking Targaryen. Now, this is probably gonna be the shortest section of the entire video because there's only one fucking Targaryen to talk about that we know of for a majority of the story. We'll dive into that once again more later, but there's only one person to talk about and no, I'm not gonna talk about Viserys. Bro got cooked fast as fuck, not really much notable things to say about him. Don't let that fool you just being the shortest section of the video. The Targaryens are probably the most feared house to ever exist in Westeros. The Targaryen motto is fire and blood. Throughout history, they live by death and destruction to have power and control of the seven kingdoms. They own dragons, which is represented by their sigil of the three-headed dragon. With the command they had over these dragons, they utilized their power to bring Westeros and the world to its needs and controlled the seven kingdoms set upon the Iron Throne for a vast majority of time. Targaryens have the belief and outlook that they are superior to everyone else. They also have a strong grasp on fate and destiny. They have an apparent a tendency to go mad, which we'll dive into later. We see their ultimate downfall with the death of the Mad King spearheaded by the Baratheon Rebellion. Two surviving kids of the Mad King fled into exile, those being Viserys and Daenerys Targaryen. Daenerys, her being the last Targaryen for a majority of the story that we know of, her whole hat and role is leading her to sit upon the Iron Throne. Throughout much of the story, she isn't actively an integral piece to what is currently happening in the land of Westeros, but she is set up throughout to play a vital role later. Meanwhile, she is spending her time gathering her forces, freeing slaves, and liberating everyone she can. This garners her as seen as compassionate and strong and persistent, someone worthy of freeing Westeros from the tyrants and the control of the Seven Kingdoms. Danny valued kindness and showcased the ability and need to adapt to liberate the world in a way that was best for everyone. Now, with all that being said, she is also a key element towards the tide changing within the show and the fandom. But for a large majority, she was loved by everyone alike, even though, like I said, she wasn't an integral piece to the main story. So as you have seen, I have laid out a vast majority of the characters, their arcs and stories, the complexities of each, and that doesn't even scratch the surface as there are many characters who are iconic and golden in the show that I didn't even name, such as the Hound or Lord Varys or Littlefinger, Lady Olena, Oberyn Martell, Theon Greyjoy, Joffrey Baratheon, there's so many fucking golden characters. For a while, they were able to juggle all these elements and find fulfilling ways to satisfy the viewer's experience. So what happened? Well, I have discovered three major factors that were pivotal into the spiral downwards of the franchise. For starters, the first five seasons, most of the key factors were directly from the book. The dialogue, iconic scenes, all the moments, just pretty much everything. There were of course aspects added in. One of the best aspects they added in were the conversations between Arya and Tywin Lannister. I don't believe those are in the books. So they added their own sauce and flavor, I guess you could say, and removed some elements. But, but majority of the key details were directly from the book. So what happened after season five, they just completely ran out of material. Yup, nothing else to adapt. Cause see, George R. R. Martin is a very slow writer. Some would even go as far as to call him lazy. As mentioned in the intro, the first book was released in 1996 and was followed up by the next two in 1998 and 2000. But then the next book wouldn't be released until 2005. 
and one wouldn't follow that one until 2011 and that's the year the show started it's now 2023 and as of last year it was reported that two more books still need to be finished to even complete the series meanwhile the show finished in 2019 over four years ago so you guys can clearly see the problem right the two people running the show known as D, D david and dan or as people refer them to now as dumb and dumber more on that later for reason two they had to completely come up with a lot of the storylines and continue people arcs from scratch with nothing basically now, I do want to say that George R.R. R. Martin was a huge helping hand throughout the first five seasons, even went as far as to directing a few episodes, I believe. So I do want to believe he gave them some sort of insight on what could possibly be coming and they went from there. But who knows, because post season five, he had no apparent hand in anything within the show anymore. What is also strange about all this is that d d won the position to run the show by guessing the true parents of Jon Snow when they met with Barton the very first time. So they had some level of understanding of where to take the story and characters, but just executed on it poorly. The dialogue diminished in some areas, things felt more rushed, Character arcs begin to fall flat. Even with all that in season six and seven, the cracks started to show there, but there was enough gold and intrigue there to where fans and critics still enjoyed and rated them fairly high. They didn't outdo earlier seasons, but there were enough for everyone to continue anticipating how the story could and would play out. Now, recall I said D&D &D received the job due to correctly guessing Jon Snow's real parent, who turned out to be Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark thus making John Aegon Targaryen and rightful heir to the Iron Throne. Now, I can't put into words what a gigantic reveal this is. This makes John literally the prince that was promised. This reveal within itself sets up so much promise and possibilities for the future of the story and for them to predict and guess this in 2010 and have years before that reveal was ever even to be told or shown to fans you would think they hit the nail on the head with their storyline and outcome right well no even with this information they had absolutely no idea or clue what to do with this reveal and it's my belief that this fatal error of not planning ahead for what to do with this character post reveal is a top three reason for this show's destruction the second dumb and dumber had to come up with any material or ideas for themselves within a story with so much world building and very close and careful attention to detail to every single character within a story everyone started to see them for the frauds that they are to further prove and emphasize my point, I'm gonna list off a bunch of characters that have been killed off within the show, but are still very much alive within the books. And this is only a few, there's many characters I can name. So once again, this is only a few. The two huge characters like Lord Varys and Lord Baelish, both killed off in the show, still alive in the books. Of course, Daenerys, Jaime, and Cersei are all still alive, as well as Cersei and Jamie, two of their kids, Tom and Marcella are still alive. All the Tyrells are still alive. You know, Marjorie, Lady Olena, and so on and so forth. Our boy Holder, he's still alive and breathing as well. We have Sir Barristan, we have Shireen, we have Stannis Baratheon. We have so many characters within the books that are still alive that got killed off in the show. Now, why this is a big detail is it's fine if they kill off characters in a show. They've been doing it the entire time. The problem is post season, I wouldn't even say five, season four, the killing of these characters felt less impactful. There wasn't no meaning to them. They just started doing it just to do it. We all know the amazing scene of Cersei blowing up the Sep, killing the High Sparrow, killing all the Tyrells, basically taking over and becoming the queen of the Seven Kingdoms amazing and beautifully shot scene like literally probably one of the best scenes within the show but there was no repercussions or consequences for that action and it's funny because the high sparrow was talking about how 
everyday normal people when they come together they could overtake a kingdom a throne they could do this if they come together as one so the fact that she blew up an entire set full of people and got no repercussions after makes absolutely no fucking sense no matter how cool the scene was he killed off a lot of important main characters within that set and nothing came from it once again it's funny because they the debt started to have less impact remember early on ned stark his debt literally incited a fucking war we got to think about it joffrey baratheon his debt led to Tyrion's trial by combat his whole trial to be fair was fucking amazing so debts in the older seasons has so much impact and implications on all the other characters and the rest of the story while later on that shit just failed to be the case another example is sir barris and of course he was with daenerys bro they literally killed him off by the sons of the harpy i believe some random no name faceless men killed him off just for the sake of killing him off when in the mad queen arc that we're gonna talk about later he could have played a pivotal role in daenerys's character but they decided to kill him off just for the sake of having a fight scene just for the sake of killing him off and that's another problem within itself because game of thrones hasn't always been about the fight scenes it's about setting everything up to getting there the setup is just so beautifully executed that it makes the fights and the events that take place that more amazing but they just literally killed off bro just to have a fight scene and that's so fucking crazy to me it kind of became a situation of when they didn't know how they could be able to juggle all these characters at once anymore because they had to do everything by themselves they decided to just get rid of half of them that's what it felt like and then everyone else's story which we're going to talk about later they just combined them into one big story to make it easier on themselves but once again for reason two we're going to dive into back to what i was saying about them just killing off the characters think about it stannis baratheon he fucking in season two his attack on the kingdom the battle of blackwater that shit is so fucking amazing and was a big highlight of the show because it highlighted the battles that they didn't have in season one because of budget it highlighted Tyrion. it highlighted so much about the story and then his character just kind of started to stall out as they didn't know what to do with him anymore literally in season five i believe he dies at the end of season five bro is just traveling around at the fucking ball with Jon snow he isn't doing anything integral to the story bro is repeating the same lines about wanting Jon snow and the wild Inch to join him literally throughout the whole season just keeps repeating the same fucking lines and then with no good ending like he just they just kill him off he even killed off his daughter that which was uh like i said a cool scene which is gonna sound crazy because he's killing a child but it was a crazy scene i would say but then even that amounts to nothing they got a chance to do everything on their own come up with a story after having a piece of information of who Jon Snow is, they decide not to even release this information until in the season seven, season eight, with limited amount of episodes, and then do nothing to execute and play off this. So, this is like I said, one of the biggest three reasons Dumb and Dumber failed to execute at the ending of the show. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people know about this that the books aren't finished. Cause I would guess most of the fans of the shows are from the books. I don't know. That's just a huge reason. And like I said, once again, it's 2023 and the books still aren't finished. And the show finished four years ago. Just think about that. So they had no plan of attack on anything they possibly was going to do. That's just, unfortunately, one of the biggest reasons the show fell towards the end. Like I said, the cracks began to show, like there were slight cracks in season five, six and seven. They were definitely more noticeable, but then the wheels completely fell off in season eight and it's going to be sad when we got to talk about that. But yeah, that's the first major reason. They, of course, ran out of books, had no more material to adapt and had to come up with shit on their own for once in their life and just completely failed at it.
Now, the second factor that was catastrophic to the outcome we received is that apparently Dumb and Dumber were in a rush to finish the show off as as possible. See, there was a rumor that D&D had committed and earned the chance to do a Star Wars trilogy that will focus on the post Skywalker era of it. So with that amazing opportunity and chance on the table, they decided it was best to be done with Game of Thrones as quickly as possible. A show that could have easily been 10 seasons at minimum, at the very least 10 seasons, was shrunk down to 8 and even more so with season 7 and 6 only having a combined 13 episodes. Once again, this completely destroyed the pacing of the show and dismantled any progressing character arcs and stories and made everyone kind of revert to the most generic versions of themselves. They gathered everyone together in one area, making the world and atmosphere of the show feel so small in comparison to the vastness we felt in earlier seasons. Literally, people were traveling across Westeros in fucking the matter of 15 minutes when it used to take an entire fucking season for them to get to point A to point B be before but now apparently they could go from the wall to dragonstone to king's landing to winterfell in a matter of one episode it just felt bizarre the pacing sped up so fucking much anything fans loved about characters was quickly washed away and left a sour taste in everyone's mouth of the foolishness we were watching unfold on screen Tyrion, one of the most politically and clever minded people in game of thrones history became a complete idiot and started making countless mistake after mistake for the rest of the show jamie lannister who grew to be a well-beloved character one of one of the best developments we ever seen reverted back to his false self and said lines and did actions that didn't fit who he always was or or who we learned him to be none of the growth we saw with his character stuck around he started rambling about how he never really much cared for people the innocent which we all know it's just completely untrue when we learned that he killed the Mad King in the first place to save as many lives as he possibly could. We of course, like I say, had Jon Snow just revealed as Aegon Targaryen become as bland as possible. Like his character got so much worse after this reveal, which makes no sense. I'm at a loss for words. He had no say in anything. He just blindly followed Daenerys until the last moment. His story and progress ceased to exist. He was given basically three options to select in every single scene. And literally, you guys know the three lines. He either said, we need allies, I don't want it, or you're my queen. That was bro three lines the entirety of season eight. And he's supposed to be the most integral character to the story. He is the prince that was promised. He is the rightful heir to the throne. All the ways they could have took this story and they literally chose probably the worst way possible. Like I can't even fathom any way they could make it. they could have made it worse than what they did. This was character assassination to a whole other level. Now just not just killing off one character, but damn near your whole entire cast. Even Cersei her character was fucking restricted in season 8 I guess all she could do is look out a fucking window like she did absolutely nothing in that season and she was the last villain of the story or well I guess technically it was Daenerys but Cersei was the last true villain in the story and she did nothing the entirety of season 8 at the very least the one thing that was set up for Jon Snow throughout the entirety of the show was his one-on-one -on -one face off with the Night King. It was basically sign, sealed, and delivered. A battle between the two were inevitable. It would be a battle of the ages. Dumb and Dumber couldn't even fulfill that. Give us that. Give watchers that. Something they've been setting up for so fucking long. John never gets a proper showdown. And Arya, a character who I stated is my favorite, ends off the story of all stories in a way that's in just such disbelief to fans and heartbreaking because throughout eight fucking seasons she had no ties or integral parts to that story at all like y'all don't even understand i'm getting so mad recording this section because the mistakes that were being made are just so blatantly stupid and obvious of what should have happened 
but let Dumb and Dumber tell it, they wanted to subvert our expectations, which makes no fucking sense when you do that in a way that makes no fucking sense. Even Daenerys herself, who was always kind and compassionate and cared about the safety of others, turned into some virgin of her father and killed millions of people within King's Landing to take the throne. Now, many people try to defend this and say, oh well, she lost her dragon, she lost her sign date, she fought her whole life for this, not to have someone like John come in and take it from her, all the signs were there, and I just completely disagree with all that, but what I would say is, if this was done over the course of an entire season, where proper development and events took place, then maybe, but no, all this happened in the span of three to four episodes in which it felt like nothing more than plot convenience to get the series over with in those episodes. Throughout the entirety of the show, I never thought anything or felt anything was unbelievable what was happening in front of me. It all made perfect sense, it all led to something else, and it was fulfilling, it was satisfying. Once again, it made sense. I'm in Dumber, wanted to finish off the series as fast as possible, move on to their little Star Wars, and just says, who gives a fuck about Game of Thrones? I guess they got tired of it, and they were just done with it. So, what's funny about that is, they apparently lost the Star Wars deal after all the backlash from this fucker. So, that didn't even happen. I think they ended up signing a deal with Netflix or something, but... Who fucking cares? They ruined an entire show, one of the greatest shows of all time, gave it one of the worst endings ever, just for the sake of ending it as quickly as possible. And then not even going out their way to do their normal 10 episodes per season. They literally cut down the last two seasons a total of 13 episodes, as if they never gave a fuck about the franchise, the fans, and upholding the status that the show had in general. I, I just don't know, like, so that's the second main reason. They just wanted to end off the show as fast as possible, move on, and it just left bad taste in everyone's mouth and completely ruined one of the biggest franchises of all time. Now the third and final section for my reasons for the downfall is just simply plot armor. And I put this as my third reason because this one is kind of like a cause and effect, a consequence basically up because of the other two reasons we had on this list. Because they ran out of books, didn't know how to write a fucking story to save their life, they couldn't do anything on their own, they started throwing in a lot of plot armor. Because they were trying to end the story as fast as possible, get it over and done with, done in eight seasons with only 13 episodes in the last two seasons combined, they threw in a bunch of plot on. I pointed out earlier how they began to kill off so many characters, there weren't any impactful kills, which is still true, but for the characters they didn't kill off, they had so much plot armor, it's fucking ridiculous. And through seasons one through four, there was absolutely none of that. If you got stabbed, shot, I said shot, shot with a bow and arrow, I guess. If anything happened to you, you were dead. If you got caught lacking, made any mistake, you, you reaped the consequence. Like the shit, that's what happened. But later in the story, so many fucking characters get away with the most bizarre shit where I'm like, oh, they are for sure dead. But they weren't, what the fuck is going on? So we're just gonna point out a whole bunch of examples that happened later in the story that kinda killed the emerging into the story. It made it even less believable than it already was because we know this is a fictional world, obviously, but the way they went about the story, the telling, how everything unfolded, it made it feel like this was actually a real place. But as the story continued to go on, we started to see that just wasn't true. These characters basically got superpowers, this survivability that no one seemed to have throughout a majority of the story. Now all of a sudden, 9, 10, 11 characters have. So we're going to be pointing out a bunch of moments later in later seasons that just killed the emerging into the show. And when you're watching it, especially when you're re-watching, you just like, damn, that absolutely makes no fucking sense. So the first one I have to start with is Battle of the Bastards. Oh my fucking God. So many people love this scene. And I'm not saying it's not a cool fight scene. A lot of people seem to believe it's the best. But I can't help but see all the dumb shit that happens within this fight. 
so first off we see john of course charging the army by himself to try to save his brother his brother dies he falls off the horse and a whole army is charging him by himself and bro just escapes basically free of charge like nothing happens to him like i could not believe the dumb shit i was watching and a lot of people once again love this scene and fight but i can't help but see all the stupidity going on with it and once again it's cool as fuck i know one of the best battle scenes but i can't put it the best just from the simple fact that it turned into a generic fantasy tv show where the main character is doing whatever the fuck he wants because he can't die next up we of course have aria when she was leaving Brock she decided to leave the faceless men she didn't want to kill anymore she was going back home or going kill everyone else on her list she gets shanked and stabbed up i don't even remember how many times two three maybe four times by the girl that was with the faceless men then dumped over the bridge into the river and she's just walking normally through civilization like i did that start my favorite character they just killed her off this coming from someone who didn't read the books at that time who didn't know that uh she was still alive or that the books weren't finished or that anything like i had no clue what was going on i legitimately thought she was a goner she's just openly walking the fucking streets bleeding out it's just too contrived too convenient it's plot armor that's all i can say is strictly plot armor the episode with the most plot armor and we all fucking know this season eight episode three the long night oh my fucking god we have seen scenes all throughout the show of these white walkers gunning for them literally running all their heart out in this episode i never seen them move so fucking slow for plot convenience We've seen characters who were definitely supposed to die just be alive. Fucking Jon Snow was surrounded by an army of White Walkers. And I'm like, what the fuck? Is they really about to kill him in this scene? They literally cut away and they cut back and he's perfectly fine. Fucking Sam, he was on the ground trying to fend off the White Walkers. And bro, you can't tell me he wasn't supposed to die in the scene. Bro was not putting in no work benefited enough for him to survive at all like what the hell and then Jon Snow once again when he's face to face with the fucking dragon staring eye to eye and the dragon just doesn't blow his fucking brains out it just it takes away so much and because like I said they were known for killing off main characters in impactful ways but in later seasons they with off people in no impactful ways to have no importance later on in the story and when they have the chance to do that they just let every single character damn near survive plot armor is one of the worst things to happen within tv shows movies or any type of media plot armor immediately kills any immersion into that world because you know everything is gonna be okay it's gonna be fine and once the story gets like that then they, they probably did the right thing and just killed it off because you cannot do that with something like plot arm it completely takes away from the totality of the entire story now after those years after the show ended everybody completely just remembered game of thrones for the tragic downfall it had all the great memories felt tarnished because we knew how the story continued to go and it honestly just felt horrible but then a glimmer of hope happened a new series was announced a prequel house of the dragon focused on house targaryen and their dragons the time they ruled and fought over 200 years prior to the game of thrones series and i can honestly say that show alone is what revitalized my love for the game of thrones fandom it made me go back and rewatch the whole game of thrones series and even put out this video to you guys it made me want to talk about game of thrones again that's how good that show was i literally just finished the show less than a month ago rewatched game of thrones and i immediately booted up to start recording this video now i will admit people have a few problems with the show we talk about how it's boring or way slow paced than compared to the original series now while i do agree that it is very slow paced 
I think that's what most people loved about the earlier seasons of Game of Thrones. Once again, it wasn't always about the fighting and the spectacle and things like that. The conversations, the dialogue, just the nuances, the important bits of details we get in the conversations between all these characters made Game of Thrones what it was. It led to those spectacles and those iconic moments being even bigger. But Game of Thrones was first and foremost about conversations and dialogue. I believe them slowing it down is what is one of the elements and essentials that made Game of Thrones the phenomenon that it was and it was perfect for the House of the Dragon series. Season 1 of House of the Dragon is currently completely focused on the political side of the show. The plotting, the planning, the scheming I was talking about. Once again trying to outmaneuver your enemies and even your family. The fight for prestige and status. You can feel the tension throughout every episode and scene, especially as the episodes continue to go on. Literally, in episode 8, it gets to the point where you can rip the tension out of the fucking TV. It's so fucking high. Like, you can feel it throughout every scene of every episode. That's what made Game of Thrones special in the first place. The ability to have viewers on the edge of their seat about the unknown, about being able to capitalize and execute on it and fulfilling ways. House of the Dragon has done an excellent job pushing the franchise back into the limelight and I'm sure it will be more cautious moving forward in how they plan to continue the series. I do believe all the books for House of the Dragon are completed and I think I heard they're not expecting to go over four seasons so I don't think they're planning on overstaying their welcome like Game of Thrones did but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Game of Thrones is a show that has so many unanswered questions of the past, present, and future possibly but House of the Dragon gives us a look into one of those and can build a bridge to the present that we do know. After I'm finished recording this video I'm actually planning on re watching this season because I'm so hyped for season two of House of the Dragon. I might be making a video on that. You guys can let me know if you want that down below in the comments. But until then, it has done wonders saving a series that I came to believe was completely dead in the water after the season eight ending. I can't wait to see how the show continues to play out. I don't even want to read the books. We just gotta all sit and pray that it doesn't meet the same fate and be thankful that it revitalized our love for one of the best shows of all time. But that's Game of Thrones, the meteoric rise and fall and resurgence, but that doesn't sound as good in a YouTube title, I don't think. But there's so many things and aspects I kind of didn't touch on that were big problems as well. Of course, went over all the character assassination, but I didn't even talk about Bran and him not using his powers at all in the Long Night episode or any time after the Hordor situation except to go inside Ravens, which was completely useless. I didn't talk about Bran becoming king dumb as fuck there's a lot of aspects i didn't touch on but i hope you guys got the main point of the video it was many factors that helped make the show the sensation it turned out to be and to be fair we have to get dnd &D a little bit of credit because to be honest we've seen a lot of adaptations over the past few years just completely crash and burn like trash as fuck so even if they were copying out the books for the first few seasons they did it to the greatest extent possible because we got everything we wanted early on but like i said adaptation is not as easy as one two three like we think and they also like i said added in their own elements of flair and style I mentioned earlier the conversations between tywin and aria one of my favorite parts of the entire show two of my favorite characters interacting must see tv the ending was just unfortunate it was played with so much unnecessary shit the pacing once again sped up uh, too much plot armor every fucking where like i said so many characters that just gained plot armor and the characters that didn't have it and were killed off were killed off in unsatisfying ways of viewers and just didn't make sense for their characters i should have dived in that, into that more with like peter baelish the way his character died, his whole story post 
the Bucks, like, it's just trash. Him giving away Sansa. Like I said, there's so many things I didn't even touch on. I tried to just give an overview of the rise and fall. But overall, Game of Thrones will still go down as one of the best and biggest shows of all time. It was just a complete spectacle in all aspects. Also, with House of the Dragon bringing about a resurgence and two more books having yet to be finished with different possible outcomes, who knows? We might be in for more Game of Thrones in the near future than we think. Once again, my name is Jarius and this is Chaos Conversations. Leave a like, comment, and subscribe to join the Chaos Crew. And also, if you enjoy videos like this, go down below in the description and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Any franchise or anything you want to see me do a deep dive, retrospective, or callback into like this one, whether it's completely dismantling and ripping apart that movie, franchise, or TV show, or talking about how much I like or love it. So once again, go down below in the description. But like I said that's the meteoric rise and fall of game of thrones explained you guys could tell me any other elements i missed like what once again this is one of the most massive shows of all time and it's hard to say anything about it that hasn't already been said but i'm pretty sure there's some layers and aspects i just didn't touch on that you guys will be sure to let me know down below in the comments but this is probably gonna be my first ever video on either of my channels that is over the one hour mark so I don't really feel like editing this, but I'm gonna have to get to it. So until then, winter is coming. Stay safe, Chaos Crew.